Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator, and Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business here in Park Slope in Brooklyn, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you all sincerely for spending the evening with us. I'm very thrilled today to welcome Eric Lonergan and Corinne Sawyers for a discussion of their new book, Supercharge Me, Net Zero Faster, which is out now from Agenda Publishing. We're also joined by author and professor Bruce Usher, who will be moderating tonight's conversation. Now to some housekeeping before I introduce our guests. Uh, we've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe setting. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click on the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please do click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. We will be asking those at the end of the program, so please don't be shy. There's a chat box through which I will be posting a link to buy tonight's book if you haven't already. And one caveat for tonight is that we're all at the mercy of our own home internet connections, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise and we'll try to resolve them quickly. We're entering into a bit of a slow season for events, but we do have some really exciting virtual ones planned for you this summer. So do head to our website, communitybookstore.net, and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. In particular, on Wednesday, July 13th, we'll be hosting Mary Ziegler, author of Dollars for Life, The Anti-Abortion Movement, and The Fall of the Republican Establishment. She'll be in conversation with litigator, author, and activist Julie F.K., whom we also hosted last year for her book, Controlling Women. That program is up on our website now and taking registrations. So now, a little about tonight's guests, and we'll get started. Eric Lonergan is a policy economist and author with more than 20 years of experience in financial markets. He's also the author of the international bestseller, Angrynomics, and Money, which was published by Routledge. He has written for Foreign Affairs, The Financial Times, and The Economist. He also advises governments and policymakers. In a personal capacity, Eric makes direct investments in social enterprises. He also supports and advises the Empathy Museum. Corinne Sawyer started her career at the UN working on climate change. She has spent the last decade adv advising global businesses and governments on climate, sustainability, and food systems. She's co-founder of More United, a not-for-profit tackling tribalism in UK politics. And Bruce Usher is professor of professional practice and the Elizabeth B. Strickler 86 and Mark T. Gallagher 86 faculty director of the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise at Columbia Business School, where he teaches on the intersection of financial, social, and environmental issues. He was previously an entrepreneur and worked in financial services in New York and Tokyo. And he is the author of Renewable Energy, a Primer for the 21st Century, which is out from Columbia University Press in 2019. So without any further ado, I'll hand it off to you, Eric, Corinne, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Noah. Thanks, Noah. Well, we'll just get started. Um, so let me just jump in with a, with a question for Green and, and Eric, which is uh, writing is hard. Writing a book is especially hard. Uh, what was your goal in writing this book? What, what motivated you to, uh, to write this? I can... I can start with that, which is, um, you know, having, having worked in this field most of my career, I think for anyone working in <clears throat> sustainability, um, it's frustrating. It's been frustrating, the pace of change, um, despite the fact that there's been a huge shift in, in both policymakers and business leaders recognizing that we have to move incredibly fast um, to act on the climate crisis. Um, I still felt we are not being smart enough um, and there are some false and unhelpful narratives out there about what it's going to take for us to uh, kind of at least stay within within a two degrees scenario, which is a phrase you will have heard, which is sort of a, a, a best case scenario, really, in terms of temperature rise. Um, so yeah, it was a feeling of frustration and probably you need a motivation like that to do it because it is hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, would you add anything to uh, Corinne's uh, comment there? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, 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 you know, probably the real answer was we, we found ourselves stuck in a house together during lockdown, uh, <laughs> both of us doing calls on, you know, Corinne on trying to get businesses to change and me trying to make sense of what's happening in financial markets where there's this kind of semi-bubble, semi-genuine trend in kind of environmental and social investing. Um, and I think also, um, I guess probably over a five-year period, I started to get very frustrated as an economist in the way the problem was being characterized. Um, so I think that the, the prevailing narrative that getting to net zero or transitioning the economy 
is most people, I think, in the, in the general discourse, think of it in terms of lifestyle change. Um, and, and I also think it's a kind of, one of the things, you know, I, I think it's like a movement without a manifesto. Mm. So, you know, if you think of movements like Extinction Rebellion in, in, in Europe, which have been sort of trying to really bring the public's attention, or even people like Greta Thunberg, mm. who's had an amazing influence. You know, if Greta Thunberg was in power tomorrow, what would she actually do? Right? And I don't think most members of the public have an answer to that question. So part of our mission was we want everybody to have an answer to that question. So literally, if we put you in charge, how would you do this? So at least our understanding has to have clarity and purpose. That's right. Uh, so that was something. And then I think we just really frustrated me as an economist by this is another domain which I think has been hijacked by economists in a very unhelpful way. So there's almost this division between less the scientists will disclose the problem, which is very rigorously presented and very um, uh, terrifying for most of us when you listen to the scientists. And then it's like everybody delegates to the economists and the economists go to one chapter of the textbook and come up with a really simple, neat solution that works in our models. And I'm a trained economist and that's kind of like, uh, in many ways, I think been a, been a huge error um that it, it, it isn't they're in the wrong chapter of the textbook and the true economics i finally i think is also um actually policy prescriptions that are much more viable politically right um, so that was kind of for, i think for us personally a very strong motivation behind writing the book yeah 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 well uh beyond that beyond the COVID. <laughs> There are issues that, that allowed you to do that, which is, you know, there's a silver lining there, which, which I think is terrific. Uh, you both use the word frustrated and frustrating, uh, and I couldn't agree more. I started working on climate change more than 20 years ago, and it's incredibly frustrating to see two decades go by, and, and many ways we've made progress, and you also talked, Eric, about, you know, are we in a, a green bubble or actually a green transition? I want to come back to that issue that you raised, but going with this, this point on frustration, shift the conversation a little bit away from economics to policy, just for a minute. Um, what is wrong with policies that are currently in place or the direction of the policies uh, to address climate change? Well, I'll start on that one. Yeah. So if I take what I would say most people conventionally, if you talk to journalists, for example, what they think the kind of prevailing policy is, tends to be centered around the idea of a carbon tax. Um, and I, I think at a political level, this is a disaster because most people now associate green with tax, right? And we're already seeing that in Europe, and I think in the United States, that but certainly in Europe, that there's a populist opposition is coming from the tax perspective. Now, why is the carbon tax um, bad policy, to be, to be brutal? Um, the, the first reason is, is that most of the carbon intensive goods that we're producing are what economists call price inelastic, which actually means in, in simple layman's terms, if you push up the price, you actually don't get much of a price response. Right? So if you look, for example, at the federal highways in the United States, I believe they are actually funded via... Back to me too. I can still see you clearly. I don't know if it did. Uh, okay. Uh, just oh, right. Sorry, it's just gone. Sorry. sorry it looked really like it went off the screen. So, yeah. yes, yeah, so federal highways, I think, were originally and may indeed continue to be funded by uh, tax on, on fuel. Uh, part of the reason is precisely because um, it doesn't cause a collapse in the use of fuel, or else you wouldn't be able to fund your highway. So, if you look at the history of fuel taxes, uh, one of the reasons fuel taxes are very attractive to government because they raise revenue. Now, if you think now in an economist textbook, that's kind of OK, because you can recompense for what the economists call an externality. So you can say, well, you're causing this pollution, but I could pay you back in some indirect way. Um, so you're depreciating the federal highways, but I could pay for that depreciation. But the point here is, is that that's not what you want with climate change. With climate change, you want people to, to collapse their usage. Right? And this is a kind of subtle point, but it's really, really important. So one of our observations is, is that in order to change the responsiveness to price, you need a very close substitute. And what that means is you just need an alternative. 
So if people have already bought a petrol, or as Americans would call it, a gas vehicle, and you keep on, and they need it to go to work, and you put up the price, it's just going to make them poorer because they still need to go to work. Maybe they can make some efficiencies around the edges, but they really can't change unless it's punitive to the extreme, right? right. Which is which is hardly socially acceptable or, or or a very sensible policy. So if you if you contrast two approaches here, if you look at what the Norwegians have done, is and you say, well, let's take electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, most consumers don't mind if they have a petrol vehicle or electric vehicle. They'll buy whichever is cheaper. Right? Right. Now, Norway has gone, okay, we're going to make electric vehicles cheaper. We're going to rig the tax system. So use taxes and exemptions. So you cut all of the duties, cut all of the tolls, cut all your taxes on electric vehicles. So the list price is lower. And then lo and behold, you're getting huge demand. I mean, Norway has, I think, a, a major economy or developed economy is the highest penetration rate now for electric vehicles. That's right. That's correct. And that's yeah. about 90% of sales. Yeah. Um, so the UK, by contrast, has one of the highest levels of fuel duty in the developed world and has a very low penetration rate of electric vehicles. Right? The government just collects loads of revenue from taxing us. So that is a clear example of how switching it from how do I price an externality appropriately to let me target the relative price of the substitute. It seems like a subtle distinction, but actually has profoundly different consequences. And our sort of overriding kind of policy mantra is make the green option cheaper. We want in every sector, if it's a plant-based, if it's an impossible burger, I want to go in a Burger King, King and the, the impossible burger is 30% cheaper. Yeah, yeah. No, a substitute's got to be more attractive. I couldn't agree more. In some cases, substitute may be a better performing alternative too, right? I mean, um, electric cars. I, I happen to drive one. I think it performs better. So maybe Absolutely. you don't even need it cheaper. You just need it to be more attractive, a better product. Absolutely. I mean, what, what, what were your thoughts on that as well? Well, I was just going to build on. You know, we have this sort of saying in the book, um, which is is obviously a generalization, but we also think it's it's a good guidance for for policy and system change which is uh, people only change behavior if the alternative is cheaper better or their friends are doing it you know, so we're informed by social norms businesses only change behavior if they make more money or if it's illegal and mm -hmm. politicians only change their behavior to get or stay elected and um again kind of one of our frustrations was a slight lack of realism about these incentive structures that we're operating in and yes some people have gone vegan you know for the sake of the environment but we can't count on enough of the population doing that we have to get the incentive structures right um and what we sort of arrived at this this idea of, of um the relative price of substitutes by looking at the the big success stories of the last you know decade or two in in in, in climate progress and you know the collapse the price of solar now the cheapest form of form of electricity in the world um there's a the uk has a fantastic success, success story in terms of scaling offshore wind power over the last decade you know, which now, you know on some days accounts for 50 percent of our grid electricity and you know we'll pretty quickly get to most of the grid over the next six to ten years um this evs example which is in all Scandinavia, but also there's some, some Chinese cities which have reached kind of similar penetration rates of sales. And what they all had in common was tapping into these positive incentives. The, um, you know, at the systems level on solar, there were huge subsidies pumped in by the, the Germans and the Japanese, you know, in the, the 90s and the noughties. Um, similarly, the UK government in the offshore wind example set what we call contracts for difference, where they essentially assured a price so they made it economically attractive to the producers whilst the price of the technology was still coming down. Um, so we, we coined from these examples this idea of EPICS, which stands for Extreme Positive Incentives for Change, um, which we thought sounded a bit silly when we first came up with it, but then oh, it's, it's got a nice ring to it. I, I like yeah, it. I like it's done. Great, great, great. I like it. So, um, so it's kind of one of our guiding mantras on policy is yeah. we need to deploy EPICS. EPICS are what have worked. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it's intuitive when you think about some of these realities about human and institutional behavior change as well. It, mm -hmm. it, the pace of change, we have to halve emissions between 2020 and 2030 at a global level. This, yeah. this is an extraordinary pace of change required. It's essentially a massively accelerated industrial revolution 
we have to kind of artificially decommission parts of the economy and accelerate the building of new low carbon versions. Um, but we have these success stories of ethics. Um, now, what, what people always ask is who's going to pay for that? Um, sorry, maybe I'm preempting your question. <laughs> no, 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 keep going down that route. And then I want to, well, 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 maybe can I just, on. Sure. Yeah, can I just right. roll, roll back one second? Because sure. the other thing I, I guess is really important, which we lay out right at the beginning of the book, is, um, is, is we need a very clear roadmap. And the roadmap, which, which isn't ours, but is kind of, I think now a consensus amongst what perhaps best described as the kind of energy policy community is, is that, that really what we need to do to solve climate change is to make electricity renewable. Right. Now, the, the, the experts here, and I've realized engineers disagree as much as economists, but the experts will disagree about whether you can go from 70 to 100 percent. But in a sense, that isn't the debate. You know, the point right. is the world is closer to 20 percent currently. So right. we all need to get up to the 70s and 80s on renewable electricity. Now, if we get electricity renewable and under existing technology, we make we electrify transport, manufacturing and buildings. That is 70 to 75 percent of global emissions. Right. Now, what's really interesting, and this goes to the narrative point that, that Corin made right at the outset, if you think about that, that's a completely different narrative to what's in most of our minds about what climate change means, because that is about capital expenditure and investment. Right? Yeah. That will create lots of assets. That's going to create a new grid. It's going to create new offshore wind farms, onshore wind, new solar farms. That's investment spending, which generates a return. And despite interest rates and inflation and everything, it's generating returns in excess of our collective cost of capital, right? Which is how much it costs for us to borrow and fund it. So that is wealth creating and asset creating. So the first kind of key point that we have to understand is, and that's also a problem of regulated utilities, right? Is about getting electricity supply right. Um, that's a very different characterization of the problem, both as a kind of practical issue, but also in terms of the costs and benefits, because to be honest, on a 10 to 20 year view, we should all have lower electricity. I mean, you, you know, I, I study markets in my day job. If I look at the long term price of natural gas and oil, they are for, phenomenally volatile, which we've experienced at the moment. Yeah. Ultimately, if you install excess capacity in wind and solar, you can price it pretty much wherever you want. Um, you know, once you've once you've recouped your return on capital, so it's marginal cost. The actual cost of producing it is very very low. So we should all have in the long run uh, lower electricity. And the really interesting thing is who loses from that? Well, it's actually an accelerated loss on the owners of existing fossil fuel assets. That's right. Yeah. Right. And and we can talk. We can come back and talk about that. But that is not most of us. It is true that most of us have some fossil fuel assets because maybe our homes are dependent on fossil fuel. So there may be some investment in our house that's required and we might have a vehicle. But other than our kind of vehicles depreciation rate and something that we might need to change on our house, um, actually the cost is being borne by and large by the small population that owns most of the assets. And the if you look at the carbon assets as a share of global assets, to be honest, they're a pretty small share. Sure. Can I just very quickly clarify that because you're um, assuming a lot of presumed knowledge and I think it's just really important to hammer home this point about costs versus investments yeah. because it's it's a, a something that again I find quite frustrating is um, you know McKinsey came out with a report about the nine trillion per year cost they actually first said cost and right, it was very misleading. I, 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 I yeah. Know that report. yeah. Then yeah. they got some cr criticism. And I think they did change the language to investment, but yeah. Um, and and we often hear on the and on investment. Just to interject for a second that they were talking totals, but actually we already are investing. Great. It was, I think, it was, it was the incremental. The incremental wasn't that large. Exactly. Actually. The incremental that well. was yeah. that was three trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we're already spending six trillion on these sectors. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But the, it, it was misleading in that respect, but also this talk of cost. And you, when you hear the media talking about this, who's going to pay for this? It's going to come from, from households, from tax, from you know, the national budget. There's going to be a loss somewhere. 
But this idea of a cost versus an investment, we use this very simplistic analogy, which might be patronizing to those who get it, but I still think it's helpful Definitely. around um, spending money on a vacation versus spending money on an extension to your house. And when you spend money on a vacation, it's basically money down the drain. Obviously, you're kind of spiritually better off for having rested, but yeah, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. have an asset. You might have party. Yeah. <laughs> when you spend money on an extension to your house, you should be adding to the value of your house. So you should still have that value. It's just in a different form than it was before. Yeah. And what, what we are making explicit is the vast majority of this cost is that latter category of spending money on yeah. our houses. We are building uh, valuable assets in our economy, which will create wealth for them, for whoever is investing in it, be it the, the government, we're creating wealth for the government, the government can then distribute in whichever way it wants. So okay. that, and that's a key concept. Yeah. Um, that's I, I'm glad you I'm glad you pointed that out that you interject on that because you're right that gets misunderstood all the time and it's the it, it gets the heart of it right investment yeah. has a return in fact most of the industries today have a pretty decent very low risk and therefore attractive risk adjusted return solar yeah. wind the electric vehicle sector and so on so you're absolutely right cost is, is different does, doesn't mean there aren't sometimes costs associated with the decarbonization but sure. but they're smaller than people think yeah. So, yeah. so I want to switch gears a little bit. You've touched on this, both of you. I want to um, come back to sort of these success stories. Eric, you raised the word greenwashing, and 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 just to can, the, the issue I want to raise. Another frustration I find in this field is that um, many people will sort of just uh, bring it down to there's good people and bad people. There's 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 there, there's sort of the evil companies, the oil and gas companies and the good companies, the renewables companies. And in my experience in the world of business, it's not really that way at all. Um, as you pointed out, Grant, that business are motivated to, to make a profit. That's what they are designed to do in our market system. Uh, I've yet to meet a CEO who wants to, you know, run a business that's shrinking and dying over time. They all want to be in a growth industry, yeah. um, and they'd like to do that in a, in a business that's not viewed as as as, as evil. Um, so, what do, what are your thoughts on both the topic of greenwashing and the topic more specifically of energy companies, oil and gas companies? What is their role in this? Do they have a role, or is it just the better we can put them out of business, the better off we'll all be? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, and you know, I, I don't know how familiar the US audiences with BP, the, the UK uh, oil and gas major. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they're fairly well known here, yeah. Absolutely. Well known, yeah. So, you know, they have announced a very ambitious transition plan over the next 30 years to transition to being, by 2050, a sort of entirely renewables-led company. And it has been observed that they are trying to do something which there are either no or very few successful case studies for, which is the incumbents <laughs> before right. an industrial revolution surviving and still playing in the same field after that industrial revolution, because usually you die and they're trying right. to they, buy those they, odds. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is, it's impressive they're trying. Um, it's a really interesting question. I don't think we tackle head on in the book. Um, well, for the oil, for the oil sector. Yeah, like what's their what's their role? Yeah, I, I think though, you know, the, if you look at the most successful oil sector companies in Europe, companies like Shell, or if you take some of the Scandinavians like Orsted, they are changing very rapidly. And in a way, mm -hmm. the way it can work is if they starve the carbon side of their business of capital, they actually are generating an awful lot of excess cash because they're still generating huge returns in their existing assets. And then they're redeploying that to invest in, in offshore wind, for example. And I would say, actually, if I take, look at a business like Shell, now this is, and I, I agree with you, you know, I think most people want to do the right thing, but they're much more likely to do the right thing if it's in their interest, right? That's how I tend to think about it. Exactly. Yeah. So we want to make the policy to make it in their interest to do kind of the right thing that they, they are predisposed. And Shell have come under pressure from shareholders, from activists, from the courts in the Netherlands. There's been a huge emphasis. Um, but yeah, and, and, and it's really interesting. And again, you know, apologies for being a little bit technical about this, but this is in a sense what we want to happen, which is 
Shell now won't invest in new oil and gas unless they think they're going to make a sort of 20 to 25% return. So they need a very, very high return. But they will invest in offshore wind for anything from a sort of four to six percent return. So they have a much, much lower hurdle rate. And again, this is important because when you're thinking about capital investment, which is a big part of you know, what we're really describing is needed, you know, actively targeting this cost of capital as a policy is a very, very smart way to accelerate the investment spending. But that is a sector where I think broadly the market signal is actually working quite well. Having said all of that, you know, we mustn't be naive. I think vested interests are a huge problem. Um, you, I mean, you know this in America, we've seen this with a tiny minority of people who are employed, employed in coal who've been able to like derail policy. But right. you see that in other jurisdictions as well. We have a tiny minority of people who vote for the government that, that we have here who don't want to have wind farms and they've been able to change the legislation on onshore wind. And if you look at a country like India, where there's a lot of coal production, that is occurring in some of the poorest provinces where the whole political economy is where you have cheap coal, it employs a lot of people, it, it goes into steel production, and then that finances the political class. These are the, the vested interests. We have to be really smart about how we try and tackle them. That's right. As yeah. you pointed out, it's often a very small number of vested interests that have great power in, in some cases. Yeah. And the other thing is there will be temptation for free riding because you, because some of these sectors are being starved of capital, oil and gas and coal assets are going to get cheaper to buy, to buy a, a coal mine or a, a, you know, anything along that value chain. But we're in a market where the product is selling at a high value. So if you, if, if you so wish, there's a lot of money to be made, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, especially uh, in the short term. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that doesn't help us. Which, yeah. which speaking of the short terms, I, and I, I don't know precisely when you finish writing the book, which I'm just... Doing a little shout out here right now, uh, holding it up. Um, but I assume it was before the, you know the, the the tragic war started in Ukraine, and obviously, uh, from particularly if sitting here in the U.S., we you know one of the big questions we looked at lens is is what's happening in Europe right now in terms of the energy crisis there in the war is this going to slow down the clean energy transition or accelerate it? And I I know that's a debate at the moment, and there seems to be people with both and i was just very curious what your thoughts were on i feel on quite strongly it's going to accelerate it dramatically um i think when we look back in a decade's time it's going to be a, a critical turning point uh, i was in germany meeting with policymakers and economists and i i was astonished but now in the very very short run yes they are keeping existing coal capacity going, turning on coal capacity that they've mothballed. But the speed with which they are embracing renewables um, is absolutely unprecedented. And they have an extraordinary balance sheet. I mean, Germany is the lowest cost of capital in the developed world. I mean, until recently, it had negative interest rates. Right. It, it still has interest rates below 2% out for 30 years. Uh, they can fund as much as they want and I think it is, um, yeah, I mean, an unknown fact is if you look at the consequences of the oil embargo in the 1970s, Europe used to be very dependent on Middle Eastern oil. Today, Europe imports no oil from the Middle East, and that is a direct consequence of what happened in the 1970s. And I think if when we look back at this, we are going to see a collapse in demand uh, for gas within the energy system within Europe. So personally, I think what it's done is it's kind of actually aligned a whole series of interests. We clearly have an objective in terms of global warming. There's also an objective in terms of the fact is that, uh, you know, wind and solar are now the cheapest forms of electricity, particularly if you have a very low cost of capital. We won't be in the technicalities why, but capital is more relevant to their cost yeah. structure, cost of capital. And then the final one is, is now security. Um, so you you have kind of that alignment of interest, I think, is powerful. Yeah, Give another another driver there that always existed, but people really didn't think about it that much the, the, the security implications and just the the, the the advantage of distributed generation, which has got a huge advantage to that. Uh, Corinne, any anything you, anything you want to add on that that topic uh, before I move on in terms of? No, no, I broadly agree. I mean, obviously, we are seeing 
the politics is the worrying the, the kind of populist dimension. Yeah. Mm. But I think that, I don't know if that's necessarily tied to the Ukraine war. Well, only in that, I mean, the, the, you know, a sad, the timing, Europe has really serious economic challenges. I mean, the United States, people understand the cost of living issue, but you can only imagine if you compounded the cost of living issue with a colossal, I mean, the increase in gas prices is genuinely, we've never seen anything like this in Europe. And not only that, you know, the impact on food prices and security, this is really, really difficult for the next two years, I think. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. So the, the economic impacts of the war on... on yeah, yes, I, have, yeah. I have great concerns around that. My, my brother, who uh, actually works for the UN Corps, and like yourself, Chris, uh, you know, he, he's, he lives in Stockholm, and uh, he said his, his electricity bill is up 10 times. And, and, and that's just, you know, at some yeah. point that's impossible for people. Yeah, um, very quickly, that's impossible, yeah. yeah. So, and we're already seeing, as we said, sort of, you know, some right-wing kind of politicians and pundits, you know, blaming the cost of the crisis on net zero or climate activists, or it's becoming the kind of the bogeyman, right. you know, and you're seeing that in the US as well with the kind of the ESG wave becoming a, a bogeyman. For the yeah, right. yeah, although I find that a very strange bogeyman because it's, it's, yes. it's an awful one, but, 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 a, but a similar and much, much smaller, less, less dramatic yeah. scenario was in, in, in Texas, uh, I guess the year before last when you had these ice storms and the power system went down and power yeah. rates took off and everyone blamed renewables because, it was the thing to blame, of course, being the new the new thing. Um, and of course, that wasn't the issue at all. Um, yeah. no. I mean, this is why we need to change the narrative, because and we need to change the economic policy, because we simply have to convince people that if they had more renewables, their cost of electricity would be lower, and one has right. to prove that, because yeah. then you have a much more you know th then actually you can see your way out of this in a way that's consistent with a more sustainable economic model too. That's right. That's right. And we see it over and over again. As soon as people offer renewables at a lower yeah. cost, everyone signs up and that's that's what works. Um, yeah. Terrific. We'll just change. Speaking of cost, one thing I want to touch on briefly and then and, and then uh, we'll take one or two more. Yeah, we've got time for a couple, couple more thoughts and then uh, we'll, we'll take some questions. Um, the other thing that's changed recently, obviously, is, is the rising interest rates. And, and again, since since you since you published the book uh, in a very short period of time, interest rates have shot up globally, pretty much everywhere in the world except Japan. And people think Japan's going to crumble shortly on the interest rate front too. <laughs> so we're all we're all in the same boat. Uh, interest rates are up. Um, does that change anything in, in in the book from your perspective, or any 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 uh, positive or negative? Probably, in terms of the, before you know, I let you come in, with your you know Eric is the interest rate now. Uh, I, I, I included context. that from the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> provide context to the audience that, yes, interest rates do play a, a kind of important role in our thesis because this point you alluded to, that we've both alluded to, that this is fundamentally an investment, not a cost. And the extent to which you are, it is affordable and you're creating wealth on the back of it is linked to the cost of capital, which is linked to interest rates. And we have over the last decade or two been in ex a period of extraordinarily low interest rates historically which you know, I actually saw a quartz article recently you know saying that we wasted the area of low interest rates we should have been investing in housing we should have been investing in renewable energy it's like know. yes we have yeah. another frustration um, yeah yeah exactly. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah sorry so I'm just framing why it's, it's yeah, relevant yeah, absolutely. is yeah. uh, low interest rates are enable many more viable projects and a much quicker scaling of this new low carbon infrastructure that we need. So low interest rates are a very favorable piece and the big thesis in our book was we need to absolutely make the most of them and governments should be borrowing and then lending on to you know, um, the relevant parts of the private sector. Now, things have changed. I'm going to hand over to you to... Yeah, uh, no, but Karin's absolutely right. I mean, another way to think about it is if you think of, you know, buying a property to, to rent it out, for example, usually what you compare is the interest you pay on your mortgage versus the rental income you're going to receive. And that's no difference to considering an investment in a, in a wind project or a solar project. You look at what the cost of borrowing is and you look at the price you get for the electricity and you see if your return is going to be higher than your cost of debt right? and your cost of equity. So obviously, if those interest rates are going up, 
to be honest, ultimately that actually does mean a higher electricity price to make the project viable. So it is directly relevant to the, 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 all of these issues. Um, the, the only thing I would say is, certainly if you look across the developed world, it is still the case that interest rates are extremely low in the context of history, uh, at least to the government, right? So even if I look at the United States, you know, despite where inflation is, despite where employment is, you know, 30 year treasury yields are still below three and a half percent. You know, I have to kind of double check. Is that really right? I mean, that, right, that's, right. Stuff, that's yeah. barely a positive real interest rate, you know, and you think you can get six, seven percent returns on offshore wind without too much difficulty. So it doesn't change the fundamental point um, that absolutely we should be investing in our infrastructure because it makes a return in excess of our cost of capital. And that is particularly true, you know, if you look in Europe uh, or you look at Japan uh, and even economies like China. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, uh, touch wood, um, that equation is still valid. The other point I would make on this, and we're already seeing this in Europe and perhaps on an 18 month view in America, is you know I, I don't think we've abolished we've ended the recession yeah you know, so at some point there will be a recession again and it's likely that interest rates will come down we really mustn't squander these opportunities those i think and particularly we we do think there is a role for smart intervention by the state right because the state's cost of capital in particular is counter cyclical by which i mean you know, government bond yields, if the US goes into recession, those 30 year treasuries could be at one and a half or two before we know it, in which case it's worth the American government borrowing to accelerate um, the green transition and build out this, this uh, investment capacity. That's right. That's right. And you, you talk about that in the book and, and, and being able to essentially leverage the government's ability to borrow at very low rates and often yeah. real, negative rates. Uh, and the, the point you, you, you may, I would just add that certainly here in the US, new renewables, wind and solar compete with natural gas. It's, it's, that's how we get our power here, uh, declining use of coal and nuclear. And the price of natural gas has gone up dramatically. So the price of renewables is up, but the price of natural gas is up even more. So in that sense, I think renewables here are more competitive than ever, even in a more challenging environment. Um, Want to want to change gears one more time before we take uh, take questions. And this um, this is an issue that you know I, I hear often. I'm sure you do as well. Which is okay. Agree with everything you say and you wrote about. But why should my country, the U.S. or the U.K., you know, make these efforts when other countries are not? And of course, people often point to China, which is by far the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions today. But whichever you know, you can point to any other country. In other words the free riding challenge that exists in climate change. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Why should a, a nation yeah. state show leadership on this beyond the moral and ethical reasons? Uh, or yeah. maybe those are the good reasons. You, you, what are your yeah. thoughts? There's a few, a few thoughts on that. I mean, Eric's Irish and uh, we've done a lot <laughs> of- hold it against me. Yeah, we've done a lot of, <laughs> you know, the festivals and stuff in Ireland. And they're a really small country. <laughs> What's the population? <laughs> Like, five, five million. Yeah. yeah, I think they have more emigrants, like more Irish living abroad than, than in Ireland. Oh, really? um, they did not. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the, the question there is very salient. Um, uh, and and what, what we always point to is the power of role modeling, because that's what policymakers do. They sit down and they say, where is their successful example? What Singapore done? And this thing right. tiny, not impactful on the global economy. Look at Norway. Yeah, Norway exactly. A lot of folks are looking at Norway's EV policies and 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 looking to replicate them, even though in aggregate the impact is not, you know, huge on global emissions. So this piece around role modeling, what good policy looks like, is hugely impactful. Because as I said, that's what policymakers around the world do: is they sit and say, where are the good examples? What can we? What's been impactful? And what can we replicate? That's the first point. The second point is, you know, we do think sort of China is a bit misunderstood. Um, not in not in the extent that they're kind of acting out of a, a moral uh, exigency to, to combat climate change, but A, they are scaling renewables capacity at an extraordinary rate. Uh, greater than any other country in the world, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. China has installed more wind power 
than the rest of the world in 2021 than the rest of the world in the last five years. Yeah. Right. And obviously it's it is of a different an economy of a different scale, but that's still disproportionate. Extraordinary. Absolutely. Yeah. So um they are our read on it is they see being competitive in renewables as what it is to be a competitive economy in the 21st century. It is just desirable to be a relevant economy because they see the writing is on the wall. Yeah. You know, similarly, Saudi Arabia has committed to invest 100 billion in renewables by 2030. Again, I don't think they're necessarily doing that out of the good of their hearts. They're doing it because it's they can they can see that that's what it is to be a modern economy. So I think that. I think there's often some misunderstanding and underestimation about what some economies are doing and that they're going to actually, China is already the world leader in some kind of solar, solar PV manufacturing. They're actually going to get ahead of other economies in terms of their capabilities to, to win from these booming new sectors. Yeah, yeah so I think they're, 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 there's both, uh, you know, if we think of renewables, they're actually cheaper, so you're better off, uh, particularly given where the cost of capital is. But then there's this economic advantage that you can you can role model and set an example, which is hugely influential and powerful. Um, but you can also get a technological edge. And America, you know, is kind of in many ways has historically been uniquely placed because if I contrast Ireland with America, Ireland can never scale a technology that there are no scale economies. Right. right. It's, right. Um, there are scale economies in America. I mean, that's part of the reason when people look, you know, why is all the technology come out of America, not Europe? Probably because America scales, it, it, you know, it's, it's a continental economy. Um, so America has a huge opportunity as it's already in areas. If you look at, at businesses like Tesla, but you also look at areas, even elements of offshore wind, or you think of nuclear, um, you know, if you think ultimately air travel, why wouldn't America want to be a world leader? And I don't think you're going to be able to be a world leader unless it's a sustainable technology. A carbon intensive technology is going to be isolated globally yeah. and is gonna be pariah state status. Um, and so, yeah, I think that is ultimately, certainly when you look at the United States, that, that really is a big motivation. But, you know, there are also really fascinating economic opportunities. I mean, we were just in Ireland speaking to people working in renewables and they estimate that offshore wind, Ireland could have as much capacity as the United Kingdom, but it doesn't need that capacity. So they're looking at generating green hydrogen for export. And then all of a sudden, you know, that is just a huge economic opportunity for them. So I think one has to, there are huge positive upsides. You know, we have to do this. I mean, look at what's happening to the heat waves currently. You know, I was looking at what's happening to temperatures in Florida. You know, I, I spend time in Italy because my mother's Italian. I mean, what's happening in northern Italy at the moment with the droughts? I mean, you know, th this is a crisis right in front of us. And, and I think, you know, the, the global perception of this is just going to continue to change as rapidly as it is. So it's, it's both in our interests and the interests of our children, but also it's our economic future. That's right. That's right. I mean, certainly on the, on the interests of our, of, of, of our children, there's no question about the need to tackle this. But I completely agree with you on, on, on the nation state's desire to lead uh, economically and technologically. Uh, again, as just as most business leaders I know want to be in a growth industry, I think most, com most countries want to grow their economies and provide economic opportunity for their citizens. And this is, and, and not to downplay the the, the environmental challenge that we face and importance of this, but this is the greatest economic opportunity since the last industrial revolution. This is, everything's yeah. going to change. Um, but it's, it's, it's uh, this issue still comes up a great deal, especially here in the US with respect to China. It's a- you know what I would it, also it, it, add it, the point is, sorry, but just on, on the ethical point, you know, we don't teach our children a free ride. That's right. You know, we don't say to our kids, you know, it's okay to hit another child if you can get away with it. As right. <laughs> you know, or it's okay to lie or, you know, um, you know, so why do we want to do that as a nation anyway? Yeah, 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 exactly. So well, we hope, we hope. Let's, uh, let's look at some questions here. I've got the, uh, the Q&A box. I just opened it up. I'm going to uh, just, I'm going to maybe shorten them slightly as I read them out to you. I don't know if you can see them or not. But um, the first question here is, there's been calls for oil companies to drill more and there was a story here about Macron, uh, President France, asking uh, Biden to open up more land to drilling 
what do we do about those real headwinds in dealing with inflation? So I guess we, we talked a little bit about this issue in, in Europe and, 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 and fossil fuels, but I guess the question is, what are you doing here and now? Because there is a, a real problem in this coming winter. It could be a, people's, uh, people's lives could be lost without fossil fuels. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think this is, I agree with Eric that when we look back, we will see the Ukraine war as an accelerator or a catalyst, but it's not a linear, it's not linear. We will, and I believe we have to, to feed our, our energy systems. Um, and I think we will see some kind of, some projects that were maybe being decommissioned, kept, we're already seeing this, right? They're, they're extending their life you know, some new drilling projects will happen. Um, and I think the socio kind of politics of not doing that are, are too complicated ethically um, when it's the most vulnerable who lose out. Um, but I, I still think in aggregate, you're seeing national commitment to accelerating energy independence and, and renewables and allocating more investment renewables that will override these kind of near term, let's just get through this next winter. Yeah, the other thing I would just add, you know, in America, I was looking at it today. If you, I mean, if you, if you look at the oil price uh, specifically, I mean, the oil price was higher in 2007, 2008. I mean, in real terms, actually over 15 years oil price, uh, they've just been incredibly volatile. Um, That's right. You know, so I think there's an element where one needs to be careful one isn't being gamed here by vested interests again. Um, and, you know, the other thing I would say is the oil price is cyclical. I mean, it's, it's a really simple observation, but, you know, again, this is my kind of day job. I mean, just look at the oil, what happens to the oil price in a recession, it collapses. This is not really about the, the global oil industry being soft capital. This is about cyclicality and COVID. And then, of course, we've thrown in some additional you know, China switched to natural gas and away from coal was a big global shock, and then for the Ukraine. Uh, but I would not at all be surprised if we see a big fall in oil prices over the next 12, 18 months. It would be very foolish to reverse our climate policies, and then we look really stupid uh, right. in 12 or 18 months' time. Much more sensible to have a medium-term view. You can, if you want to build solar farms, you can build solar farm in 18 months if you want. It's actually much more faster than most forms of oil exploration and development. So if we really want to solve electricity at, at time frames that matter to us, let's just be really, really focused in acceler accelerating renewable technologies. That's right. Yeah, and you're, you, it's funny you mentioned the time frame because I think that's something people uh, are unfamiliar with. And you said 18 months for a solar project. I mean, you can actually build a solar project in three to six months if you can get it permitted. There you uh, go. Construction is a couple couple months, maybe down a couple of yeah. weeks uh, with the right, uh, right setup. Um, I mean, that just goes to show it. Right? That's just willpower. I mean, that's planning. You know, in an, right. if you think we're in an emergency, let's just say, you know, permitting takes a week, you know, or that's whatever. Right. Let's just right. put everybody on it and dramatically accelerate permitting and you can have a boom in solar. That's right. Right, right. In many cases, it's not even just about, it's not subsidies. The government just needs to speed up permitting and let people build things. Spot on. Yeah. And if we really want to do it, yeah. so, you know, so Macron, you know, next time I'm in France, they should get on the phone and, uh, and say let's let's make those permits a lot easier to approve, please, <laughs> President exactly. Biden. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I wish I wish it was that easy. Yeah, we, we Maybe can have you can do that with an executive order. I don't know. <laughs> another conversation about Nimbyism in America, but that's a, that's a different topic. <laughs> but this next question, I, I want to get to other people's questions. I got so many questions of my own, um, which is not Nimbyism, but sort of related. We touched on this before. So the question is: so much of climate change investment starts as nonpartisan, but then becomes hyperpartisan. I'll just interject there. You, you, Corinne, you brought the issue of ESG. I mean, ESG has somehow become partisan, and yet it's just an investing strategy. Yeah. Um, so the, the question uh, from, from uh, this listener is, how do you prevent that from happening? It's a tough question. <laughs> That's I mean, I worry as an outsider that this is American political culture. I mean, it's not my position to say that because I worry that I see it in our political culture as well. Um, and, and this goes back to, you know, stuff... I wrote about an angrynomics with Mark Bly. It's, it's unfortunate that there's an alignment of interest between the political class and the media, I think, to make things partisan. Because, you know, it's easier to hit click. Um, and it, it's easier to reduce debates that require some thought and subtlety 
uh, if you make them, if you simplify them and make them partisan, because then I don't need to do any thinking because I know which way I'm going to vote. Right. Uh, I, I do worry about it, but I'm not sure I've got any answers for that. Yeah, one. it's it's a hard one, and it's partisanship in general is something that I find profoundly depressing. I think all our all our political discourses suffered um, partly, probably because you're right, right, because of the rise of social media and maybe just where we're where we're at and kind of the cycle. Um, what I I suppose one little inkling of hope could be with time proving that climate investment is the right side of the economy. Am I phrasing that right? It's kind of like being with it <laughs> um, is the best thing for the economy. And I know the media still has an amazing ability to twist and misrepresent, but the more that case becomes incontrovertible, um, yeah. it'll be easier to kind of, uh, uh, it'll be harder to be kind of hijacked uh, by the right way, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Or to put it put it another way, Korean. I used to work in finance. That the best way to get people to pay attention was to make money. Yes. Very, very yes. crass, yes. but it's true. And and ESG investing has actually been a very very successful strategy for people. Um, uh, so you know maybe that's just it. Just keep your head down, keep moving forward. Exactly. So this this next question is sort of one that gets to the heart, I think, of a lot of a lot of people's uh, thinking on, on on this and why they uh, read, read your book and and, and other books on the, on the topic. And and that's about you know what what should we do individually? So let me read the question. It says it feels like there are so many struggles or even existential threats competing for our attention. Can you speak to the ways the fight against climate change intersects or doesn't with other threats to human rights and lives? So there's the individual fight, as my now my words, you know, against climate change. But of course, we all live in a world of so many other issues and challenges that we face. Um, probably more so than ever. Sometimes it feels like these days. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, my my just as a sort of quick thought on this. I mean, this is a very profound question. We we don't really have time to do it justice. But I would say that. Um, you know, if you actually look at the share of the global population that's that's employed in the fossil fuel industry, it's pretty small. It's less than it's about 0.7 percent of the global labor force. Yeah, um, we have a real possibility to create, you know, a much much better economy. And so I think both in terms of the distribution of assets, but I also think in terms of training and skills. Um, and that because this is about investment, I mean, you alluded to the industrial revolution. This is really about transforming the capital, the infrastructure of our economies. If you look at economic history, that is actually typically creates a huge increase in human well-being um, and standards of living. So uh, in one way, I do think that the climate transition can be aligned with our with broader humane issues which is we can actually use this to create much better functioning uh, economies and societies that work better for more people. Yeah, I would just add something on that, which obviously this is, you know, I work, I work in ESG. So this is it's something I think about every day. This kind of ESG wave we've seen in financial markets and, and corporate sector, in some ways, it's extraordinary. All it is, is we are saying businesses need to be responsible <laughs> for their impacts, their social and environmental impacts in a meaningful way. They need to report on and be responsible beyond just their profitability. And in some ways, it's amazing that it's taken us to the 2020s for that to happen because it seems so obvious, right? Um, now, my view is this, this, this ESG wave of a, 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 a different, license to operate uh, and a deeper responsibility has been massively accelerated by the climate crisis and it's i would say this i think it's obviously a good thing <laughs> that businesses are forced to being more responsible and more kind of um accountable and transparent and so it it could be that there's an upside to the climate crisis bringing this to a head and forcing all the other ways in which you know human rights abuses in the supply chain and biodiversity, chemical effluents, you know, fair wages, there's a whole lot, you know, yeah, the private sector shapes so much 
And so could it unleash a new era of, you know, and you hear these phrases, responsible capitalism, conscious capitalism, stakeholder sure. capitalism, there's all these different words for it. Um, I, I definitely credit the climate yeah. crisis as having accelerated that agenda. Um, yeah, it really makes us aware of, you know, the, the impacts of, of our economic system, both good and bad, and, and yeah. makes us more thoughtful, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have time uh, for one last question. We're down about three or four minutes before we need to wrap up. Um, and this last question is, is, is uh, ultimately the heart of it, which is, what can we as individuals do? So let me read the full question, because I think it's a very thoughtful yeah. question. Uh, what can we as, as individuals do to help affect the systemic changes you advocate for in the book? Uh, of course, the greater burden by far is on corporations, governments, but what do you say to people who may be feeling helpless? How do we keep the individual from washing their hands of the whole issue? And allow me to personally add, I feel I get very concerned when I read about climate defeatists. I mean, climate denialists, I, I have no time for it. <laughs> just, just, just annoy me. But um, unfortunately, climate denialists are a shrinking group, but climate defeatists are a growing group at this point so what, 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 do, what do you say to them well maybe this this, this we, we spent quite a lot quite there's a whole chapter in the book on this and, and and we veer away from the kind of um you know whether you should use water from the tap or water in the dishwasher right we we, we don't we, we that that's to us is you know by all means one can look at things that i can genuinely do to change my life but that's not the, the main game and what we really talk about is the idea of becoming an activist and and Karen should talk more about this, but I'll just make a quick point. There's a great YouTube video with a guy called Roger Hallam, who's uh, um, uh, an academic in the United Kingdom. And actually, he's one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion, which has been this kind of sort of protest movement to try and galvanize uh, public change on, on, on public policy change on climate. And he draws on research actually by Erica Chenoweth, uh, who I think is at Harvard, um, has, who has looked at the history of effectively uh, civil, civil dis peaceful civil disobedience and, and creating change. And right. this is why one should not be a defeatist, because if you look at the amazing periods of social change in human history, they have typically been caused by a relatively small minority of the population. So I think Chenoweth comes up with this kind of magic number, and there's no statistically magic number, but it's kind of 3% of the population. So if you can get 3% of the population out on the streets, it feels like the entire population is and you will get legislative change. So I think when you look at it empirically with a very <coughs> hard head, what's actually really interesting about the history of social change is how minorities have completely disproportionate power. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I would say if, if, if we take a very uh, you know, hard-headed empirical view of it, which absolutely do not give up. The second thing I would say is that to organize now as an individual activist, we are empowered in a way that's unprecedented. I mean, we give the example in the book of, uh, what was the, um, the trainers in Brazil? Um, uh, the um, uh, Timberland. Yeah, Timberland. I mean, what's really amazing if you look at Timberland is how few emails got the attention of the CEO to the point where the CEO had to go and look at their supply chain on the Amazon and or in Brazil. And then he actually discovers we don't really know where we're getting this stuff from. And then right. before you know it, actually Nike had changed its sourcing policy. And what's interesting is, you know, you assume, oh, Greenpeace, well, Greenpeace must have thousands. No, you're maybe talking about, you know, half a dozen people. Right. Uh, and I've seen this uh, in, in my own work in Europe. So the first thing I would say to you is that, that this change will come via the activism of a small, a small percent of the population. Most of us are sheep, right? We will follow. The, uh, we agree, but we're not willing to put ourselves on the line. And the other thing is, you know, at your fingertips, you have way more power than an individual human being has had at any other point in human history. So it doesn't take many of us to actually, particularly now that companies are so conscious about their brand, about their reputation, about their claims that they're making, Brian, anything you would add? Last uh, last comment. No, I'm just I'm distracted by Paul Lavin's question, which I just want to add. Um, you know about the total cost of the system. I mean, sure. that's why well, I, we, we we actually were out of time, but give, give it a give it a uh, quick response. Yeah, go ahead, Corinne, Just you, very. You know, that's why we set up front. You know, there's a debate about whether you can get to seventy percent or ninety percent renewables. You know, there are intermittent challenges, but um, uh, you know, it, the the taking into account 
the low C and the, the low running cost and return on the capex, um, it's still economically good for us to transition to that kind of 70 plus percent scenario. Um, but we're not saying you can do it without some share of, of nuclear or hydrocarbons. Yeah. Yeah, and I would add, as, as someone who invests in those businesses, the cost of storage is coming down so quickly, and there's so yeah, many, right. uh, so many yeah. variants and technologies coming along. I, I think that problem will get solved. The intermittency problem gets solved long totally. before we get to seventy or eighty percent, as you pointed out. I think out it's earlier. a bit of a red herring. It's a red herring. Yeah, it's important, but it's a red herring. This was terrific. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for the time. Thank you for writing the book. That's the most important thing. And um, really nice to meet you over Zoom. And have well, a well, thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you, you so much so for sharing. Much. Really Thanks a lot. I couldn't agree us. more. Um, thank you all so much for this fabulous conversation. You've given us all a lot to think about, um, some, some things to be hopeful for as well. So I really appreciate that. Um, those of you at home, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you'll purchase a copy of Supercharge Me from Community Bookstore or your favorite local independent bookstore. And we hope to see you at another virtual event really soon. Thanks again, Eric, Corinne, Bruce. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you for organizing it. All right, take care. Thanks, Committee Bookstore. Thank you very much.